So. Like so. Hi, my name is Stuck and welcome to yet another episode of Bounty Thursdays on air. A show that's primarily focused around the offensive and bug bounty side of cyber. Doesn't mean that we don't like the blue team. We love the blue team, but we're here to do the offensive stuff. So without further ado, this is Bounty Thursdays. Isn't that lovely? Awesome. I'm so happy that every one of you are tuning in. We are currently live on YouTube, but we are also broadcasting live over at Twitter Spaces. If that's the way or the communication channel that you prefer, then head over to twitter.com slash stokefrederick and join the space over there. Otherwise, it's good to find us here live and direct over at stokefrederick, uh, youtube.com slash stokefrederick. Um, I got my team with me here today. We got Jason Haddix, he's here. And uh, we got Christopher Jerkeby with us today that's running the chat. And all of us is gonna be uh, presenting awesome stuff for you. So feel free to join in on this fun adventure. If you got any questions, put them in the YouTube chat and Christopher will do his best to answer those and bring up those when we do the more dialing segment later on. Jason also has a few ideas. I, I know he's been um, feeling a little bit about the hate around nuclei, which is he's not happy about that. He wants to be yeah, fun times when it comes to nuclei. So we're going to see uh, what he has to say about that. But before, before further ado, uh, I'm going to start up with a new segment and talk about things that I like. So, first off, this show is sponsored by no other than the amazing people over at Integrity. And I'm very grateful that those guys decided to, you know, support the show and make sure that, you know, we stay happy, which we most of the time do. And if you want to sign up for their platform and get played in Euros, head over to go.integrity.com slash stoke and uh, start looking for those nice, interesting subdomains that they have in scope. Uh, speaking of subdomains and numeration, uh, a new subdomain enumeration tool has been surfacing lately and this is called Dome. And Dome is really interesting because it's a, it's a selection of, of all the things that you already know. I mean, it's a passive and active collection where you will brute force for subdomains or passively collect uh, things without API access from alien wall, traffic DNS and everything. And it's very, very competent and collects a lot of data. But you can also, if you have a showdown API key or a security trails, passive total and such, virus total, add those in and you will have a nice collection from those domains as well, which is, in my humble opinion, really, really good because you you can find so much stuff. I ran this over uh, Airbnb.com for, for the fun of it and got about 3.5 thousand hits. If you compare that to, uh, let's just do a little bit of Airbnb.com over at Security Trails and see what they have. And they have about 2,740 uh, ones of those. Then uh, if we do a Project Chaos, let's do an Airbnb and see what those guys have. Oh, it's 1,598. Of course, you know, some of these are valid, some aren't, but hey, it's worth checking out. So I definitely think if you haven't already uh, put your fingers uh, on, on Dome, uh, I suggest you look into that. It's in Python and it's, uh, it's actually really fast. You have the possibility to add word list to it. So let's say that we were playing around a bit with asset notes, 2 million um, subdomains that they have. Maybe that's a good thing for you to add into the list as well. And that got me thinking to uh, the situation where, you know, everybody just puts out a lot of nice lists. I mean, kudos to, to Jason and the gang running uh, sec secure list, right? Uh, there's a lot of things for you to use when you're using your brute forcing. And there are certain things that, that come up every now and then. And, and Scan Factory is a data set, just like um, Project Discovery's Chaos, where they collect uh, and, and look for data sets all over and deliver it to you. So you have a nice possibility to use collect all this data. And then uh, the way I would do it is I would probably take all this data and just, and just dig into it a bit and see, collect my own 
Like, I, I, I grab the first domain, get rep the second, and then you create great enumeration brute force in the list that gives you possibility to find those things that stick out. Hopefully, we're going to get, uh, get the possibility to ask Jason a little bit about that, because I know he's been uh, poking around a bit with uh, uh, some of that lately, and he says that he hasn't been in the hacking scene or bounty scene, but he, he, you know, he's always a part of it. And, you know, he always had this joker up his sleeve that he pulls out and he's, oops, wow, this is Rico methodology eight. And then it's going to be something awesome that you, you, you kind of for, forgot about. So, so Jason, I, I, I know you, 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 I know you, you, you got some juicy stuff coming as always. So it's going to be, it's going to be interesting where he presents. So when you say it, when, when Jason says, says he's out of game, He's not out of the game, um, <laughs> but then again, let's get, let's back to the rest of the list. So um, I definitely think you should check out Scam Factory, right? Scam Factory is a is a cool data set. They have a lot of things in their subdomains you can go through and you can use. I don't know, this one here maybe. A lot of them. And this is where you probably would like to grip through this and create your own massive word list of all the subdomains that ever collected and brute through force over those. Why not? I mean, requests are free. And speaking of requests, FFUF, I mean, gotta love it. Big fan of Ferox Buster, but FFUF, hey, there's nothing but mad love for that tool and uh, and it's just been added some really cool new features and one of them is matching for time imagine for a second that you're uh, creating this flyover sql injection kind of thing like you you smashing in blind sql injections in in each and every other parameters that you find and now you can match for time latency. So if it times out and it fires, hey, all good stuff. Maybe that would be one of those endpoints that you will be digging into. Automation, automation, all good. Uh, and then we have our old friends over at Asin Note. I, I, I know I talked about um, some of their domains that they have. And it, it, those, those, I mean, um, with a lack of better words, the way that they have collected data and made that public, uh, it's it, it's just awesome. I'm, I'm very grateful whenever an organization decides to say, OK, we're going to put some of the findings that we have open for the public. So people like you and I or organization can use that to secure their own organizations. Like if you're not hunting yourself on your organization, you're doing it wrong because somebody else is going to hunt your ground for you. So why not use those lists for do brute force, whatever stuff you have, and you see what your devs put out. Anyway, uh, as a note, and Shubs is back on releasing videos again. And whenever that happens, I mean, Kite Runner was awesome. Uh, all the thing that you brute force over IIS directories to find hidden paths, hmm, nothing but mad love for that. So when he started to talk about Radies and HA proxy stuff, that is something you need to put your, on, on your radar. We got 2,948 views on this since the 14th of March. That's not enough. Head over and get Aston a lot of love and make sure that they get some traffic on the things that they put out because we do not want shops not to create. So let's make sure that he gets the stuff out there. Um, I saw that he's recently was at a conference in the Middle East and I didn't have the possibility to go. But one of my uh, favorite conferences that I really like to go to, though, is Nullcon. And Nullcon hasn't been active for a while. But do you know what? Do you know what? Ken, do you know what? Nullcon is back. Nullcon is going to be back again. And it's going to be training from the 6th to 8th of September. And then it's going to be the conference from the 9th to 10th. Isn't that awesome? I mean, <laughs> wrong button. Ah, I'm just so happy because it's one of my absolute favorite conferences and that they are going back again and just getting people back into Goa for this. I mean, hmm, that makes me happy, happy camper. Uh, so that's gonna be cool. Call for papers, open up. Um, well, now I guess. So if. If you want to send some stuff in and get some really interesting stuff going over at Nullcon, now is the time. Also, if you sign up here for the Notify Me, there are rumors that it might just be um, um, a chance to win cool stuff. And I'm, I haven't verified it fully, but if you sign up for that and you get notified, there's a chance that it's one winner that wins some awesome stuff. 
Actually, I know that it's going to be one, but I forgot my show notes. So don't no, don't shame on me here. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. So, but, but I'm happy that they are back. So that's all cool. And if you are in Sweden, please do visit Security Fest. Because Security Fest is going to be in the beginning of June. It's the... 2nd to 3rd June, and this is the conference where you go to. If you're in Europe and you don't do CCC or, or Black Hat, get, get over here. I mean, Gothenburg represent is an awesome conference. And if you're, if you're not going there, then you're missing out a lot of fun. So it's cool stuff. Go and visit that one. And finally, and on the least, Sekte in Stockholm is back again on the 15th or 16th of September. So it's a perfect warm up for you to do, uh, to go to the conference in, in Nolcon, deliver stuff there, and then you get back here to Stockholm and you visit Sekte and, uh, and, and you just go there. I mean, nothing but mad love for people that are putting conferences together. That's not easy. Um, and I, hopefully there's going to be DEF CON and all this other stuff uh, around this year. So, yeah, I mean, conference season is conference seasons. And that is about everything I have for this, uh, this news run where I talk about things I like. FFUF awesome, get new domains and all that stuff. So, gentlemen, welcome to the segment where uh, we, um, we take some calls in and we uh, have the possibility to see what happens in the chat. We're going to ask Christopher first. What has happened in the chat? Do we have any questions that you want to add to the adventure uh sure like the first question that we got even before you mentioned nalcon was stuck are you going to nalcon <laughs> i'm gonna do my best it's all about uh, my travel possibilities but if, yeah. if that happens i mean i'll do my best i'll, I'll do my best i really really want to get back to the conference scene and uh we will see what happens i mean if, if I'm lucky, I'll, I'll just bra drag you on and you'll have to join me, both of you. It's like, come, 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 come. Let's go to, let's go to Nolcon and just... <laughs> Nolcon is one of my favorite all-time conferences. Nolcon was, uh, was really, really awesome in a lot of ways, right? The community is special at Nolcon. The conference has great speakers, great trainers. Um, the venue is amazing, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, the whole damn country is amazing, honestly. And, um, yeah, it was just, it was one of the best conferences I've ever been to. So. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, I really I'm love in. Goa. Go. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't mind going. Yeah, seriously. It's, uh, yeah. It, I have nothing to add to that. I mean, I've been, and I loved it. So I, I, I'm really bummed that I couldn't go the year after. So, you know. Things happen, but we're we're back again, and hopefully, you know, that's gonna be all good. So, um, any any other questions, or should we start to take on callers? Uh, yeah, I don't, actually, I'm I'm going to do that. I'm going to open up with that segment. So, if you are here, and um, and if you want to uh, ask a question to Jason Haddix, or if you want to ask a question to to Christopher, you have the possibility to do that, and. The easiest way to do that is just to join in on the Twitter space, request to be a speaker, and we will add you live here to uh, to the talk, and uh, you have a chance to ask your question. In the meantime, we're going to go straight over to Christopher and see, Christopher, do we have yeah. any questions in the chat? We have plenty. There is a discussion going on in the chat right now whether you are allowed to do uh, automated scanning or not on public bug bounty programs. Is it worth doing it? When should you do it? When should you, <laughs> shouldn't you do it? And we have been discussing this back and forth, both in the chat and previously. And I think this is interesting. Jason, maybe you have something to say. Yeah, I mean, um, so that last week, uh, Corbin Leo, who is one of my favorite young hackers, um, you know, he had a thread about automated scanning specifically with nuclei right and um and he was pretty down on it he said it was a competitive disadvantage uh i guess for, for you know like answering the strict question is it allowed yeah most of the time it's allowed on programs right if you stay under a rate limit that the program specifies if they have a rate limit or if the platform specifies a general rate limit yeah it's absolutely okay um many people do it and, and that's fine uh, the Twitter thread was about the efficacy of it, and um, and it was specifically, or I think, more targeted towards the efficacy of just running nuclei out of the box um, without making your own 
plugins and um, and templates. And so I think that I think that uh, there's a couple paths you can take with this argument, right? Uh, while I super respect Corbin, I actually super disagree with him actually in this place. And a lot of people, a lot of people hate on Nuclei because it's an out of the box scanner and everyone uses it and you, you tend to get duplicates. And I'm doing my testing, right? Like I'm a recon tester, right? So a lot of the times what I get is very obscure TLDs or very obscure domains, right? That nobody has been to before. And so for me, using Nuclei is absolutely a must, right? I have to scan even with the default package, absolutely have to scan. The other day I found 11 subdomain takeovers. Uh, this morning I found a Grafana panel with default credentials. Um, so... You know, it's and it's all because my recon led me to less traveled domains. If you drop a nuclei scan against a core domain like Airbnb.com, dub dub dub, you're not going to get anything out of that that nobody else, right? Uh, Corbin is absolutely correct there. But you know, if you found something like you know Airbnb. You know, co. Uk or I don't know something, some other TLD or Airbnb DevOps or something like that that you know is owned by the company and no one's hit it with Nuclei yet, it absolutely can be a winner for you. And then the other thing is that uh, also building your own templates is where Nuclei actually is you know one of the best things you can do, right? So like yesterday the the new Struts vulnerability came out, right? And um, Patrick uh, IT security security guard, um, you know, he said building a template for that vulnerability just to check for the path that it could be present on is like six lines in YAML, right? It's it's amazing, yeah. it's super easy to build your own scans. And so if you're watching the community via Twitter or you're looking at like bug disclosure RSS feeds, or if you're just looking, you know, if you're just testing on a wide scope bounty and you find that they're using the same platform or technology across a lot of their sites, um, you can build these templated uh, nuclei scans and and basically scan the whole domain range for new stuff or things that you found that are custom. And so in that sense, also, it's a real winner. Um, so I'm pro nuclei. Um, maybe not if you're just going against like a, you know, a standard main domain, but I'm pretty pro nuclei. So. But then again, you are pro using tools to do things for you. And mm -hmm. I think that's the whole idea because if you're, I mean, Nuclei is awesome because it's community based where, you you know, people putting stuff, I mean, as soon as this dropped, I made my custom and ran that. I mean, that's what yep. we all do. I mean, there's a couple yep. of lines and you will see if it fires or not. What is primarily interesting is that if there's some obscure thing that you always look for that is not in the templates hey go for that and mm -hmm. blast it all away because you don't know what's what is going to hit or if it, you can even create templates that are extremely catered towards your target because they are built in yep. certain ways or or you're adding certain headers that's needed there there are many ways to uh, poke around on this so it I don't see an issue with the scanner solution itself. It's fast and it's reliable. And uh, that in the end, that's the most important thing. All right, we got our first request of the day. We're gonna add in S7A6K as a speaker. See when it's connecting here. S7A6K, uh, welcome to Bounty Thursdays on air. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. The silence of the nut unmuting. Here, Here we go. That didn't work out uh, the way it's supposed for you. So sorry for for hanging in, but you are now removed as a speaker. Uh, sometimes it works out that way. So we're gonna ask uh, Christopher Cook. Do you have any good things coming in? Do you um, do you have any chats uh, things that you want to add from the YouTube chat? Yeah, there's a lot of people who are asking about how to get started in Bug Bounty, as always. And this time, someone, Esperati, is asking, is there any way to study for Bug Bounty online for free? And I guess you guys know the answer to this one. No, it's not possible. <laughs> Everybody uh, has to pay a lot of money for extreme certs, <laughs> and uh, you need to minimum a CIISP to be able to attend and start to do Bug Bounties. No. Jason, can you tell them how it works? 
Oh, geez. Um, I mean, there's so many free resources nowadays to do the type of security testing that, that Bounty represents, right? Uh, the the best one is the Port Swigger uh, WebSec Academy one right now. Uh, but there's also, I would say also like contending for top is like Pentester Lab, Try Hack Me. Um, all of these things now, you know, have primarily web testing, which is probably where you get your feet wet is web testing. Um, and so those are practical targets as well as there's tons of self-hosted web apps that you can um, build yourself like um, uh, like Damn Vulnerable Web App and Matilda and stuff like that that have been teaching AppSec for years. So you can download those, those projects on GitHub, set them up yourself at your own pace and test against them. So uh, and then like for the body of knowledge, like the learning, the techniques and stuff like that, the the Bible I always say for web hacking is the Web Application Hackers Handbook, followed closely by um, Peter Jaworski's book, which is uh, what is the title of his book again? Um, it is blah, 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 uh, hacking 101. Yeah, it used to be Hacking 101, but now since he's published it, it's different. It's on my bookshelf behind me, but Peter yeah. Jaworski's book is uh, is a good one as well to mm. go through. Um, so those are good starters. Those are what I train my students with. What other ones am I missing, Stoke? Do you remember? Now, I think Vicky like? Lee also dropped a new one. Oh, yes, yeah. Vicky uh... Lee also dropped us a pretty sick bug bounty book as well for beginners, which actually you can go to any Barnes & Noble, I think, and I saw it there as well, which was super cool. So. Mm. And then you have, um, I know that... Uh... Here somewhere, uh, I can't can't find it. But uh, I I am bug hunter. Uh, I mean, um, see Shano's website that he built all yes. around live targets yep. and where you can yep. practice and do Baker and all that stuff. I mean, he is hands on awesome. He also has his book yep. that you can buy there like, that gives you like a basic methodology to get started yep. and and great resources. And if you want to pay some money for it. Try Hack Me has uh, things going on. Uh, Hack the Box has things going on. Uh, we have got Pentester's Labs. Uh, and I mean, there's almost endless resources for you if you want to practice web and porn stuff. Uh, and most of it, I would say most of it is free. Yep. All good. So uh, do we have anyone that has a question? If you have a question, feel free to request as a speaker because that is how we will be able to add you to to the conversation and then answer any questions that you have related to offensive security bug bounty and uh, you know all the things that we think are super interesting right now it seems to be a little bit vague so we're gonna go back again and see if christoph uh, christoph <laughs> if Kug has any um anything from the youtube chat that he wants to add and in the meantime i'm gonna yeah. add bashir here Okay, sure. Uh, so there is a lot of questions. This is a really tricky one from Sanjeev R. And he is using Burp and he's collecting data over HTTP and it's encrypted in AS256. And he's asking, how can it be decrypted? Ah. <laughs> it's a tricky no one, idea. I guess. Yeah. Do you ever I, repeat I think... the question one more time? Sorry. So the, the question is, uh, Sanjeev has collected data over HTTP that he thinks is AES-256 encrypted. And he is asking, how can he decrypt it? And, uh, well, I, I can try to answer it, if you, you don't mind. Yeah, bring it. So AES-256 has different modes. And if that mode that you're using is based on, if it's based on a key that is a passphrase, then you can try to crack the passphrase. It's pretty unlikely that this will work for you. So probably avoid anything that you cannot do at this point or try to extract the encryption key from a running application like a mobile app, for instance. If you have a mobile app, try to take that apart and see if you can find the key there and use that for decryption. That's my advice. Well, that's a good advice because I had no real smart answer on that. I'm like, you, you need keys to decrypt stuff. Uh, anyway, yeah. we got Bashir here. Bashir, my man, uh, or my friend, you are now live on Bounty Thursdays on air. Do you have a question for us? Hello, Stuck. Can you hear me? I can. Welcome to the show. Huge fan, man. Huge fan. Awesome. And uh, pardon my English. Uh, I am from a place... Uh, as you can imagine, like a mud house in Afghanistan. In Just a mud house? That. Yeah, I live in a... Practically, I live in a mud house. Like, has, have you seen one in 
Afghanistan pictures or videos, something like that. I haven't. You, please, um, please tag me uh, any okay, photos okay. that I you will, have will, later on. I will, I will, I will, I will send you the pictures. Awesome. So my basic question is, uh, my basic question is, I am a self-made, uh, whatever you may call me. But um, the basic question is, uh, what uh, can a good crawler do for you? A good crawler? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mean like a website crawler? Somebody that visits websites and get a lot of stuff in return? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, a good crawler for you could find all the JavaScripts and all the endpoints that is uh, pointing somewhere. It can help you enumerate both, you know, uh, visible and hidden parameters or paths inside uh, a website and give that information back to you so you can poke at it. Jason, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, no, that's a perfect answer. I think that there's levels of crawlers in the tooling scene, in the automation scene. I think that you have a lot of crawlers that um, are command line based in Linux that will do things like just follow specified HTTP links, right? And then the more advanced crawlers will actually execute JavaScript um, and try to build dynamic pathing and, um, and dynamic uh, parameter sets uh, by crawling as well. So those are kind of the next level crawlers and those things exist in Burp and uh, and some other tools as well, Zap and and things like that. So um, if you really want to get the bang for your buck, usually I do all my crawling in Burp. Um, but uh, but I also use Hack Crawler every once in a while, um, you know, in the initial phase of my automation and recon just to feed Burp. So I'll take the output of Hack Crawler, open it through Burp proxy, and then it will get all the dynamic JavaScript um, and try to execute it and everything like that. And then I feel like I have a pretty full understanding of the parameters and paths for, you know, any given website. And you can always go back and see whatever happened earlier on those yeah. ones and, and yeah. use more, yeah. you know, check out what happened on way back URLs, yeah. how, how have they been updated yep. the JavaScript and such. So it's an, it's an yeah. interesting take. Bashir, I hope that answers your question and uh, please tag me in a picture of the mud house. That would be awesome to see. Uh, we are now, move, right, remove, no, I'm going to remove you as the speaker now, my friend, and uh, move on to the oh, next one. Thank you. Uh, Gunnar, you are now live and direct on Bounty Thursdays on air. Do you have a question for us? Yeah, can you hear me okay? We can hear you perfectly. We can. Perfect. Um, so my question is, I think I've asked this question a few times to a couple different people, but um, I'm trying to get automation spun up. Um, I've watched all the talks, uh, read all the blog posts, etc., about all the different tools, chaining them together. Um, and I guess now my problem that I'm having is I'm stuck with a VPS full of thousands of subdomains and tens and hundreds of thousands of endpoints and JavaScript files and parameters and what have you. Um, and I don't really know what to do with them all. I love so that. I guess you run yep. nuclei yep. templates all over them. <laughs> That's the answer. <laughs> no, no, I mean, mate, on a serious note, though, what you have there is a gold mine. You have the beginning of whatever is needed to start digging deep. And this is where you need to do the funneling. Like any kind of marketing, anything you do, you can have an email list of 10, or you can have 10,000 people visiting your website. Who's going to be your customer? You need to figure that out. So it's all about funneling down now. Look for things that you find interesting, that you like. Maybe uploads is a thing that you're interested in. Maybe uh, there's a certain kind of API path that you are interested in. Try to, you know, the, the, it's a usual... Um, People say, they ask, how, how, how do you eat an elephant? Like a piece at a time. That's piece at yeah. a time. That's usually how it is. You need to yeah. break it down. How would you do it, Jason? Yeah, so this is a question I actually get a lot, right? And everybody's different with what they do at the output of their automation. Um, and I know that I've talked with uh, Ben Nahamsek about this before too. And it is really what Stoke just said. It's how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So you have a huge list now from your automation, whatever tooling you used of subdomains that were live, right? And so what I do is I throw them into a mind map and I have one side of the mind map that says to do and one side of the mind map that says done. And I basically take a hundred at a time and throw them into a web browser and just have the web browser resolve them, which throws them through burp as well um, and see what happens. And so you land on some sites and I visually myself 
just try to deem if they're interesting right and so pages that are interesting to me i mean like many out of that hundred maybe like 80 percent first of all are gonna redirect to the main domain of the site right so those are automatically eliminated from testing and then so you're left with 20 percent, and then that 20 percent uh 20 percent some are going to be cots applications like vpn portals or other you know portals that you know to not really be vulnerable unless there's some cve related to them so you know maybe eliminate those if or if you have like a zero day maybe you can check for stuff on those and then you're left with custom applications that the business has written your target has written um or blank uh blank web servers that you know the web server did respond but there's no content there yet and so those all those custom applications and blank web servers there wouldn't be a web server on the internet that would just be out there without anything on it, right? So those represent a goldmine to you. You have to start content discovery on them, right? So something like FFUF or something with a list, you have to find the application. Um, and then usually that's a custom application. So now what you're left with is a whole bunch of custom applications that the target has written. And those are usually always filled with the type of vulnerabilities that you want to find, right? So cross-site scripting, injection, you know, misconfiguration, off bypass, IDOR. And so then I take those, that are in that bucket, which is now down to maybe 10% of the hundred I opened. And uh, and now I start to actually test those. And that narrows down my scope a little bit more. And I have a checklist for what I wanna do on those sites. So like the general um, bugs that I'm good at and the tool, the extra tools I wanna run on them and the manual tests I wanna run on them. And then I go through that list. And then once I'm done with it and I feel confident that I've done everything I can and maybe there's no bugs, I move it over into the done section. Uh, and then I just go one by one through those sites um, until I until I find bugs. Yeah, I think I do. Um, I, I do about the same. I do a quick flyover with HTTPX before, so make sure I I, mm -hmm. I sort for titles, uh, responses, and I put those all two hundreds in one, all four threes in one. Uh, things mm -hmm. it, things that right redirect to a to C name that's uh, that I'm not interested. in. I'm always using the dash follow redirection HTTPX to know where it's going to end up because if it's a third party that I'm not kind of supposed to poke at, I, I want to stay out of that and go for the ones that. You know, if they if I do a CDN check and see if there's a is there a WAF in front of it, all the ones that doesn't have a WAF, those are definitely going into the golden bucket because those are the ones that I know I'm going to look at first, and then I eventually you know uh, go through my my process. But I do the same. Um, I use a tool called I think it's like um, Chrome Bucket uh, or something like like Bulk Opener or or something. It's a uh, plugin where you paste in the list and it just open up all the tabs. How do you do it? I use uh, I use open list. So I'll take the output of the tooling, which gives me a whole bunch of live HTTP and HTTPS links, and mm. I'll throw that into Chrome open list. And then it just opens a tab for each one. And I have vertical tabs on my left, which uh, I can just look at the titles. I can already see what's redirected. The one the one difference I think between you, me, you and me Stoke in this is that you use automation to filter via response codes. And I've had a little bit of trouble and if a redirect takes longer than normal, some of those tools will misevaluate it. They'll say, mm. you know, even the screenshot tools sometimes too will not work really well when taking a screenshot when the redirection um, takes place and it takes longer than normal. So um, I tend to do it manually and just dump everything into my browser and then just close the tabs that don't represent anything interesting. So uh, it's it's interesting that we differ there. It's pretty funny. No, it's cool, but it's different. Yeah. Hey, different folks, different strokes. We do yeah. it differently. Yeah. We do different things. Yeah. Uh, Gunnar, is that enough uh, answer for you? Are you happy with that? Absolutely. That's a lot of help. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. I'm going to remove Gunnar. you, and I'm going to add Esa instead. So, hello, Esa. You will now be added as a speaker, connecting here, and gracefully, all happy. Um, Esa. Welcome to Bounty Thursday on air. Do you have a question for us? The silence. <laughs> yes, Sam? Five, four, three, two. Oh, something's happening. I saw something. No, that's your shit. Maybe, Sorry, dude. Maybe oh. he had us on that on that low key, like uh you know, waiting to get into the queue thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> then, yeah I'm sorry. Then left. That. <laughs> then that's how it is. RK01, welcome to the show. You are being added as a speaker. So feel free to ask your question. Unmute and ask your question. We've been lucky today, Jason. It's all good. 
Okay, we'll add another one. Oh, I see, we have, uh, I see we have Six, who is the author of my uh, newest favorite, um, the Penguin icon there, the newest favorite uh, recon tool. Love to talk to him for a second. Six to death? Yeah. Yeah. Six to death, do you, uh, do you want to apply a, a, a request, please, so we can talk to you? Six to death. Six to death. Hello. Oh, Abdullah, we got hey, you. Here. Oh, no, it's RK1, right? It's RK1, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so my question is: Suppose we find uh, way back in point uh, and using some tools like way back URLs, Go, Go Plus, it is in JavaScript in point. So I have a question: uh, Which URLs we have to look for hidden in point? In so one of my friend told me. One of my friend told me you should look for .dot php file, like .dot index .dot php. Is there any other types of, uh, as you know, .png, .jpg has no hidden endpoint, but some types of, some certain types of uh, endpoint has hidden endpoint, uh, uh, like .php, .asp, is the, such type of URL should have hidden endpoint. So how to look for hidden in, hidden endpoint? This URL should have hidden point. How do we smell that type of URL? I don't think I fully understand what you're saying, but I'm trying to, you know, wrap my head around it. And when it comes to finding... Uh, okay, point, okay, so uh, I mean, let, let, let me tell you another time the same question. Okay. Suppose we find the subdomains, okay? And yeah. find the way back in points, many, suppose thousands of in points. So how to look for this in this way back URL has... Uh, hidden in point. How to look for that type of way back in URL? So, uh, when like you, we use, you uh, use Arjun Arjun Paramit tool. So, which type of way back URL should have hidden in point? Okay, good one. Yeah. Hang on. Okay. I think I get it now. Yeah. So, uh, when you're using tools like Wayback URLs, right? What you're getting is a representation of a previous state of the website at a certain time, right? And so what you're hoping to get back is URLs there that um, are no longer linked on the live page, um, but still exist. And so you'll go visit those pages. And if they're verbatim a JS file, they could have endpoints that you've never seen before in your spider because your spider never found it because the live site never referenced it um, in your in your spidering through burp or whatever. Uh, so .js files are what you want to look for, and then you'll parse them to give you all the relative and dynamic links that JavaScript can build. Um, and then also, uh, if you get just regular pages, like HTML pages or you know whatever, uh, back from a tool like that that are live that weren't hyperlinked on the site itself, it could have also embedded JavaScript inside of the, the page. And this is actually a difference between you know, a couple of different types, like I said, either spiders um, or JavaScript parsers. Many JavaScript parsers will, uh, will parse only one type of JavaScript referenced link, maybe relative or non-relative links. Um, and uh, so you have to make sure that your parser can build the links for you and is finding all of them, as well as can parse, instead of just parsing a .js file, it can also parse uh, just a regular web page and pull out the dynamic JavaScript in the regular web page to build, basically build your uh, your JavaScript endpoints that you want to find. And so you would use the tool like you were referencing in the beginning to get you the way back URLs, then you would use one of the JavaScript parsing tools uh, on those pages, and that would build your list of endpoints that maybe was not referenced in your regular spider of the site. Very cool. I think that was a good answer for you, RK01, uh, I, because that's what we had time to deal with. Uh, we now have Francella added to, as a speaker. Francella, free, free, feel free to unmute yourself. And if you've got a question for us, you can ask that question now. Thank you. Um, hope you're doing well. Can you hear me okay? We can. We can. Perfect. Um, so it's so cool to be talking to you guys. <laughs> um, my question is, so I I really like Linux and I'm about to finish my Linux Essentials course and I really like it, like scripting and stuff. And I'm fairly new to Bug Bounty and I guess like, I think um, you should at least 
you know, what uh, one type of programming language, but there is not, like, I guess, a strict path um, for you to know how to hack, like, on that path, like, Linux path, I would say. Ah, okay. I, so, so what you so what you your question is kind of that you you like Linux and you do fun stuff there and you want to take that to the next level so you can adapt it towards hacking. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um. So I'm confused because every hacker has a different methodology. Um. Some of them do recon. Some of them don't. And I I want to know like because I've watched also you and Tom and um, um videos <laughs> and that's cool but I don't know what exactly do I need to learn like do besides Linux and I guess um, like is it do I need to learn one program language is that Linux or I see what you, yeah, I see what you mean yeah. uh, <laughs> and I would like to add Cook here Cook are you are you with us I'm so like, still here Oh, perfect. Then I'm going to add you to this one because uh, Christopher has been hacking stuff like Linux for for ages. So we'll just add him here okay. for, for good measure because... Okay, I, okay, I, okay. I, Yes, all good. So the, the, the question is, if you're liking, you're using Linux and you want to take that to the next step, because the real question here with... As I see it with Francella, is either you know you can either hack Linux by itself and just figure out how to do uh, probably escalations and such. That's one path to go. Or if you can do things like me and Jason do, which is uh, primarily hack web, we will use Linux as the tool, the driver for whatever we want to do. So. We talked about, you said, what, what's going to be next? What's going to be your learning path? And for me, the correct answer is Bash. And then Python. Yeah. And then JavaScript. But then Christopher might have an I other idea. So I want to see what he says about it. Yeah, I think local Linux hacking and privileged escalation usually comes in really, really late in the, in the escalation chain. Because just getting access to a system takes a lot of effort in the first place. And after that point, you usually proven your proven your skill or proven the vulnerability enough. If you have the skill to do anything more around that, you can. I mean, if you work in military or something where you're seriously doing this, uh, then then yes, you want to do evasive stuff. You want to reach the kernel. You want to do all these kind of uh, nasty things. But as long as you're in bug bounty, all you need to do is work with Linux use Linux to your advantage, you know, bash, calling home, having nice tricks to do point post exploitation stuff, you know, you don't need to privilege escalation beyond, you know, having the user level, you don't need to break out of your, your uh, CH root or, or inside of the Docker instance, for instance, in my opinion. So does, does, does that give you a bit of an answer, Vrancella? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Pretty sweet. Happy to help you. I'm going to Good unmute luck. you and thank you for for asking thank a you. question. Uh, okay, we got another caller coming up, but first, we need to check in with the chat. How's it going, Christopher? Do you have any any question that you have from the chat that you want to ask to us? Uh, first of all, we got more questions than we will be able to answer today, but uh, <laughs> that's really nice, right? Um, I'm getting a lot of questions around recon, but I want to ask this one. Uh, Divang Solanki is asking, I found a blind SSRF vulnerability in a web app, but the request is coming from Cloudflare servers. Should I report it or should I further escalate it to exploit it? Blind SSRF, should I report it or escalate it? So he's getting the ping back to collaborator, I assume. Well, you should escalate it. I mean, because a blind SSR without any kind of uh, that you could show that, okay, so I'm touching either internal data or I can get something that proves impact is going to be informative or, uh, or, or at least because you have to show that you're doing something, even though the concept that a blind SSR is a vulnerability, if you can't prove impact with it, a triasher or a program might say, yeah, but uh, we got internal protections against that, or we have something that's uh, not going to help you out. So I would say um, look for SSR, SSR canaries or something. If you can enumerate, can you do a time-based request? Can you reach? Uh, can you send the request to an external site and get a 
302, 303, 303 redirect to a, to a local URI like uh, AWS data or local host or something and see if that times out. If it times out uh, on, on things that are valid, you are proving that you're bypassing the URI filter. So, I mean, that way to do it, that would show more impact. But if you're not, if you can't show impact, it's, it's, it's meh. I think one of the sub the sub components of the question too is like the permission to hack right when it when the request is coming from an entity that's not the hosted targets domain mm -hmm. and if the initial request was to an application that they wrote um i i consider that usually fair game if the ssrf or the or the blind uh connect back is coming from a different host but you can instigate it via the domain i would say yeah that's still in scope of testing mm -hmm. That's perfect. Christopher, you want to add something to that? No, I think it's great. I'm learning SSRF from you, man. So awesome. <laughs> yeah, but, cool stuff. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, yeah making, making sure that it counts, making sure that it has impact. I think that impact makes sense. Impact all the, all the time, all the days. Otherwise, yeah. it would be. And we don't want to be that. It's going to be sad. All the work yeah, and all guys, the important. I, I've got like five or six questions about how do you write your own recon engine? Like different types mm. of questions along that. How, so how you a write lot of your own recon engine? That. You take a yeah, bunch like of how, tools. How, yeah, like how? <laughs> yeah, you put them together yeah. in a bash script called Hunter.sh, yeah. and then you name yourself. <laughs> then you you name yourself Jason Haddix, and you uh, go on YouTube and you create a methodology around it. That's how you do it. So, so I would say I, I've actually been using uh, Hunter.sh my own script for a long time and it's exactly as Stokes says, right? I find all the tools I wanna use, I glue them together via bash. Um, I brighten some features that maybe I think that are are cool. Um, and then, you know, uh, that runs and I run it in the background on a list of domains, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you, if you are not comfortable yet enough in bash to do that, which I highly recommend you do and you write your own recon, kind of stuff. Uh, the one I've been using recently because my my box had like a catastrophic failure while I was dormant and testing um, was, is Recon for the win. And uh, Recon for the win is very similar to my hunter.sh script. Basically glues together a whole bunch of tools. You can find the repo on GitHub. And then you can also tune it to everything you want because each tool run in recon dot, uh, or recon for the win is a function in the main bash file. So you can just comment out the functions you don't want to run. Um, and then you can, you can feed it a list and it will do all of the subdomain scraping, all the subdomain brute forcing, all of that stuff. And so it's a really good one to start with for a beginner. Um, it'll automate your content discovery. There's several other tools as well. Yeah, Recon for the win, there you go. And so um, for people who are just getting started, this is like level one. And then when you get to like level two or three, you're like, how do you distribute this? How do you make it go faster? What do you do? And then I think the answer mostly that everyone is, is almost settled on, I think, is Axiom. Uh, Axiom is um, is a next level distribution framework to which you can plug Recon for the Win into, but uh, Axiom uh, basically will allow you to distribute scans across multiple machines. There was some awesome talk this week about um, how fast you can do some of the content discovery using certain amounts of hosts um, distributing an Axiom scan and scan. And so this is like that's like the next level is like it's like getting into Axiom by uh, Pyro. So. De de definitely. And uh, what I think is really interesting, I'm just going to add myself to the screen here for the fun of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And what we need to think about here is that if you want to create an automation flow, I mean, it's all described in the Axiom FAQ, really, seriously. You run Axiom Scan with all the root domains that you have, and it's going to run subfinder through those and output to a subdomains file. It's going to run three threads, which means that it's going to run on a fleet of three. Uh, and then you do the same thing. You have all the subs. You're going to re resolve those and looking for um, with the responders, resolvers. To, you want to have the IP addresses coming back, and you're going to put those into an IP uh, to a list, right? Then you take all the IPs and then you run mass scan over those. And once you've done that with, with all the ports that are open, because you don't want to waste NMAP traffic, then you parse those again over to NMAP because you really, you've done the flyover first. You save yourself a lot of time uh, because yep. even though we, we like NMAP, like NMAP, NMAP is king on all skates, all places, but it's slow. And then that's kind of how we need to accept that it's that's the way it is. So you will fly those over and then you can just continue down the list. All the ports are open. 
shake those into a new, then you scan those again, you do HTTPX to see if any web servers are open, you go witness those. I mean, this is your automation script, and you can go from one to, I don't know, uh, if you're on using DigitalOcean and you apply for a researcher thing and you open up, you can have 100 droplets running at the same time with one command that you initiate. It takes about five, six minutes for them all to spin up because they're spinning up simultaneously after your build, and then it does all the thing distributed using Kodingo's interlace. I mean, that's, uh, that's fast. That's that's next level though. Like like if you're just getting into bug bounty, maybe use something like Recon for the Win, which is uh, iterative okay. and and yeah. <laughs> I mean like Axiom is, <laughs> is I, you know when you jump into Axiom, it's it's a lot. It's a lot to configure. Uh, so yeah, but uh, it is the it is the next step for sure. And you can do this if you want to with one liners in a while loop. I mean, oh yeah, for sure. You could just do it via yeah, yeah, exactly. My, my into, a new, was... into the next one, exactly. into the next one, exactly. into the next one, into the next one, and then you end with a nice notify yeah. on the end. With all, yep. you take all the things yeah. that have gone through, and you find you start you start you end with a tom nom noms a new in the end where you yeah. just present everything over to notify yeah. slash bulk, and you will have a nice list of yep. all the new subdomains added to your Slack or Telegram or whatever. Yep. Automation yeah. is where you can do these things, so it's funny. Okay, Kirk, do we have any more questions? All right. Um, like, how do you uh, how do you find time or how do you find part time in cloud security jobs? How do I find a part time security jobs? Yeah, never mind that one. Uh, there is a lot of people who are asking about uh, uh, other areas, like uh, how do you get into or or what's the methodology around malware stuff. Uh, how to how to do uh, um, uh, malware analysis and, and and those kind of things. But this is a red team show, right? So we're talking about yes. offensive here. Yes, yeah. we're doing the offensive part. And even though building your own C2s and malware is cool and all and reversing, that's going to be on another show. That's not mine. Yeah. So, yep, I, uh, I we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. But we mm, we good. got about five mi more minutes for us to take one last caller. So I'm going to add uh okay um you guys gonna have to choose or jason yeah. select a speaker who do are they the ones with the the blue dots or people who are yes you can choose one choose wisely um let's do mr pc se about a third row down here we go First one in the row mr pc se Let's see here. Mr. PCSE, you are now added to the Bounty Thursdays on air. Uh, do you have a question for us? Fle feel free to unmute yourself and ask that question. Oh, maybe, maybe I chose someone who was in the wings. Mr. PCSE, you got this. Hey, there we hey, go. Hey. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, first, first time caller. Uh, thanks for having me. No. Um, yeah, I've watched uh, a bunch of your videos, and I am currently in cybersecurity, but awesome. on the on the defensive side, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, looking through logs, hunting for all the exploits uh, you guys are doing. Um, we, we celebrate you and thank you for doing the hard work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, I appreciate it. It's um, we have we have a lot of tools though to help us out. So, thankfully, they try to make it easier for us nowadays. But um, on that, looking to get onto the offensive side, it's uh, like the previous person said, it's uh, pretty daunting. There's a lot of different things. What would you say? Because I have like experience. I've even done some light web design back when HTML4 was a thing. And uh, I, I even learned like action scripts and stuff like that. I know a little JavaScript. Cool. Where would you think would be a good uh, entryway uh, for me? The question is going to be, though, what do you want to do? That's the thing. Do you want to hack web? Then it's one path. Do you want to be an internal pen tester? Or do you, what, what kind of things do you want to do? What, what, kind of, what kind of things are you auditing today that, that you want to learn more about? Ah, so that's a good one. See, I love all technology, right? So I feel that it's like, oh, I, I'd love to do web because I've previously did web design and I'd love to do um, even physical uh, attacks or uh, perfect uh, social. First step, you decided what you want to do. Awesome. 
So nope. you want to do yeah. whip. I decided for you. There you go. <laughs> there you go. You're going to do whip. So Thanks. what you do is that you, um, you sign up for, let's say, Port Swears Academy, right? And, and you start to, the web academy and start looking into that. But before you do that, head over to Try Hack Me. Take, um, take 20 bucks. Buy a subscription on Try Hack Me for, and do their first beginner series when it comes to web application pen testing or OWASP Top 10 walkthrough. It will walk you through all the basics that you need to know. It will even give you an educational path where you, where you have to move. And then you will have this feeling around what you like because it's a vast area. And you need kind of you need to have this feeling around what you like to hack. Because if you end up in a situation and you hack stuff that you think is going to turn out to be really boring, you're going to end up not feeling vibes around it and then stop doing it. So I would love for you to start poking at things that are semi-vulnerable, but spikes your curiosity. So you will move in a direction and, and applications and paths like uh, the Academy over uh, Hack the Box or Try Hack Me are very good because they are super beginners friendly. So we'd step you through the first basic steps on how to slowly move into whatever you do. Since you know the basics around web, front end, uh, may maybe you need to freshen up on good, those good old networking skills. I mean, if I ask you, uh, what does port 9100 do? Yeah. No clue. <laughs> okay, it's it's a it's a printer port, so LPR uh, HP printers. But then again, it doesn't matter because the the thing is that you need to understand a bunch of these things slowly and gracefully. What do you say, Jason? Yeah. So I would I would say don't get don't get daunted, right? Like many of the questions that we're getting today are rooted in the fact that this is a whole discipline. And many people think that you're just going to be able to jump into it right away, right? And so before I even started Bounty, I had 10 years testing networks and applications, right? Um, and, you know, some familiarity with Linux and web servers and stuff like that. So you're already a foot ahead with the familiarity with probably Linux and uh, and languages that are used on the web and you can develop your own website. So you're, you're already at the, like, you know, maybe 0.25 kind of uh, marker for, you know, a learning path. And so you can go through all of these self learning things like WebSub Academy or try hack me or hack the box. And you can start to learn about the individual vulnerabilities and they'll start to click with you as a web designer. You're like, oh, this makes sense. And you'll also start to think to yourself, how does this, how does this even exist in the world? That's what a lot of web developers first think, right? When they, um, when they do this. So, uh, but yeah, you'll, you'll start to learn the vulnerabilities one by one. Um, and then you'll get to a point where you're like, I have a, I feel like I have like a solid grounding of vulnerabilities. I have all this other experience that I've built in the last 10 years of my life. Uh, how do I find a job? And this is the really big, uh, un, like it's not really under discussed kind of section. And there are many resources on the web that, uh, that are starting to grow. So every quarter Reddit does uh, the NetSec hiring subreddit or the uh, infosec subreddit does a netsec hiring sub uh, threat and all of the employers who want to hire pen testers web testers red teamers um, they will post jobs there so that's one of the first resources you can go look and I, I don't just suggest that you look at the ones that um, are posting for this quarter also look at previous quarters and contact them via the email means that they provide and say hey you know, hey, I'm a former blue teamer, um, really good at blue teaming. I've spent the last, you know, six to eight months training on web vulnerabilities. It's where I kind of like the most. And uh, many people with just that level of introductory will at least give you a call and, you know, uh, and you can get an interview there. And a lot of people have their own training regimens internally. A lot of the big consultancies like NCC Group or Bishop Fox or, you know, one of the really great niche consultancies, uh, Atreides, um, some, some pen testing and offensive security groups like this also have their own training. So they'll love to train you themselves in the way they like to do things in their methodology. And so just with that blue teamer experience and developer mindset, they can start there as long as you have a good feeling on, you know, web phones and stuff like that. And so, and then you get into the cool stuff, right? Like usually you enter in through web hacking and they're like, oh, we have a red team assessment. So we're going to train you to do some of this red team stuff, which includes physical, right? And maybe you'll get to go, you know, hop through a vent or drop some USB keys in a parking lot or, you know, get to do some of that cooler stuff when you, you know, level up to the next level. So that's what I would say. I hope that was good enough answer for you, Mr. PC. Yeah, it was a, a great answer. What was that um, Reddit for it again? 
So it's called the Reddit NetSec Hiring Thread. Uh, so you still, can you find it? Uh, I can't, but we will uh, we will add it into um, we won't add it to cool. show notes because we we don't add show notes yeah. because then YouTube is going to ban us uh, for putting malicious <laughs> stuff into the comments. Yeah. Uh, just just suggest... Google search NetSec hiring thread and you'll find it. NetSec yeah, hiring it. thread. It's going to be awesome. Okay, thank you for joining in and asking a question. That is about everything that we have for today, Jason and uh, and Christopher. We. Um, as always, I really enjoyed this show, um, and I'm very happy that we got so many people calling in. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine people still requesting to talk, and Christopher has so many questions <laughs> that I think we're going to end up having to have a show eventually where we just answer questions. So uh, it might just be a thing in for the future, but for now, our hour is up. So with without further ado.